So now we move on to the um, Outstanding Achievement Award, um, which this year is to go to John Rossi uh, from City of Hope, who will be giving us a lecture entitled My 40-Year Journey to Develop RNA-Based Therapies. So I'm not going to um, introduce John. He will um, uh, briefly speak to you, and um, his son will introduce him. Um, but I would like to present him with the Outstanding Achievement Award. Thank you, John. Let's go there. <laughs> okay. I don't, don't get two awards. First of all, I would like to thank the society for this honor. I apologize that I can't, cannot give a talk myself because I suffered a, a stroke several years, years ago. My, 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 my son has graciously offered to do, do the talk part for me. He, 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 he is a researcher at Kai Farm Farm. I'd like to introduce my son, John Michael, John Rossi, John Michael Rossi. All right. So uh, what a cool moment, huh, Dad? So I, it's his dad to me, Dr. Rossi, to the uh, rest of the audience. So uh, it's my honor and pleasure to present on your behalf. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the title is My 40-Year Journey to Develop RNA-Based Therapies. And I think I've already noticed our first typo. This is um, not the Outstanding Investigator Award, so I apologize for that. It's an Outstanding Achievement Award. Okay, so an introduction. Uh, we'll run through education first. Uh, Dr. Rossi, in 1969, received his Bachelor of Arts in Biology from the University of New Hampshire, uh, followed by a Master of Science degree in Microbial Genetics at the University of Connecticut in 1971. Um, from 1972 to 1974, he took a diversion from science um, and was in the United States Air Force as a first lieutenant. And I always used to ask um, my dad what he did, and he said, well, we monitored UFOs. So I guess that was uh, <laughs> okay. Um, did you find anything interesting? Ah, shooting stars and birds, right? Yeah, so, um, and then uh, when he left the military uh, in 1976, he received his PhD in microbial genetics from the University of Connecticut. Uh, this was followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University under the guidance of Dr. Arthur Landy, um, studying RNA structure and function. And I think this is where you um, initiated your first love of RNA biology and built a career around this. Uh, in terms of professorship, uh, 1980 to current um, at the City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California, um, is the chair and professor of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. It's also the Lidlow Family Research Chair uh, and also founder and Morgan Helen and Chu Dean's chair of the Irel and Manella Graduate School of Biological Sciences. So a notable achievement is um, founding a graduate school at the City of Hope, which has produced uh, many young scientists that are gonna continue to build on some of Dr. Rossi's um, notable achievements. So why did I choose biology? So I started my academic career with an eye on becoming a forester. I think though, as we discussed, he quickly learned that this was an academic or an economic as opposed to a conservation and but I, I didn't know you were, uh, you know, a tree, tree hugger, so. Um, in 1968, I took a course in genetics at the University of New Hampshire. This experience opened my eyes to other areas of biology, including gene function and structure. So in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through my journey from education to my current interest as an RNA biologist. So a key publication from my postdoctoral fellowship, the uh, title of the paper was Discovery of Dual Function Transcripts Specifying Both Transfer RNA and Messenger RNA. Uh, this was, uh, the co-authors were Dr. Lynn Hudson, John Rossi, and of course, Arthur Landy. This um, landmark paper was published in Nature in 1981. I think the schematic at the bottom shows the, um, the relationship between four transfer RNAs and also a messenger RNA. So this was a, the first discovery of its kind. Um, 
showing a demonstration of alternative transfer RNA processing, wherein both mRNA and tRNA can share the same transcripts. Again, a notable finding. Uh, this unexpected result prompted his interest in continuing to study RNA biology. Next stop, my first faculty position and a very influential men mentor. So after completing my postdoctoral training, I was recruited to the City of Hope by Dr. Keichi Itakura, a pioneer in DNA synthesis. So he went there to, want to learn how to synthesize DNA for use as a research tool. Uh, I think a notable um, anecdote is that Dr. Itakura first told me that I'd have to learn to use these products in biological systems, including development of a synthetic promoter for constitutive gene expression in bacteria. Um, for me, this is a landmark moment um, for the use of synthetic DNA. Of course, this led to synthetic insulin, which spawned the biotechnology industry, notably at Genentech, and also for someone at Kite Pharma, where we were just approved for the first cellular therapy product um, for the treatment of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It was the synthetic biology, the synthetic DNA, that's enabled um, these future achievements. Um, so this ment mentorship eventually moved me towards oligonucleotide therapeutics, including the study of ribozyme function and utility, uh, short interfering RNA, short activating RNA function, and also the use of RNA-based aptamers. Okay, so exploring ribozymes. What are they? Ribozymes are RNA-based enzymes that cut a target RNA. They have their own ca catalytic cycle, meaning that they could act as molecular scissors, um, which is what the intent of the diagram on the right is, thus enabling robust target gene inactivation. Uh, my lab was the first to demonstrate that ribozymes could be used to target HIV and possibly other viral diseases. So ribozymes as potential anti-HIV therapeutic agents. In 1990, we demonstrated that the HIV RNA genome could be incorporated into ribozyme design. This finding resulted in a potential therapeutic strategy for a gene therapy approach to reprogram T cells to defend themselves against HIV infection. This work was published in the journal Science in 1990, the lead author, uh, Dr. Narvasarver. Effective delivery of ribozyme genes to progenitor cells using a murine retroviral vector. So while effective in vitro, HIV ribozymes were difficult to deliver into cells, necessitating the need for a more sophisticated delivery strategy. To solve this problem, we created synthetic genes for anti-HIV ribozymes packaged into amphitrophic murine retroviral vectors. This strategy resulted in stable expression of ribozymes and mobilized peripheral CD34 positive human progenitor cells, leading also to durable expression in mature polyclonal T cells. Uh, stable cellular ribozyme expression did lead to HIV protection in both um, in vitro and animal models. So the first clinical application of an anti-HIV ribozyme. So this is a very early gene therapy trial. Uh, autologous CD34 positive stem cells were transduced with the retroviral vector, as I previously mentioned, that incorporated ribozymes against the HIV, TATREV, and GAG transcripts. Targeting different sites within the HIV viral genome was hypothesized at the time to prevent spread of a quickly changing viral genome. These transduced stem cells were reinfused into patients as part of a bone marrow transplant procedure for AIDS lymphoma patients at the City of Hope National Medical Center. Results from this study demonstrated that this gene therapy approach was generally safe and also tolerable. And you can see Dr. John Zaya on the right-hand side, who is the lead investigator on this study, and still a close collaborator, if I understand. Okay, so now we're gonna take a pause um, for to view a video, uh, which is testimony from the first gene therapy patient. This is an HIV positive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patient who received an autologous blood stem cell transplant with ribozyme gene transduced progenitor cells. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and also with AIDS. And uh, I was terrified, but I, I met these wonderful doctors. You felt like you had this entire organization supporting you. And they're determined to make life better and to, to fight these diseases better and to treat them better and to, you know, ultimately to come up with cures. One of the exciting things about Loring and his even being here is that he was diagnosed with uh, lymphoma that Basically, the doctors told him he wasn't going to live beyond a year unless something miraculous happened. And it just so happened that here at City of Hope, we were doing this experimental therapy um, for HIV, uh, but the lymphoma part of it was also part of the therapy. And so 
uh, you know, he got the treatment. Here he is. Uh, it's 12 years now or so, 13? 10, July 30th. 10, July 30th. Okay. Yeah. So patients that have suffered from a relapse of, uh, of, of their B-cell lymphoma um, have very few options in terms of chemotherapy. So this, uh, what we call autologous, getting their own stem cells back under a full bone marrow transplant setting is the, is the standard of care for that disease now. You know, they care about the work they're doing. Uh, that's why they're doing it. Yes, City of Hope needs to make money to, you know, keep things moving and to, you know, fund the research and, and take advantage of the, the technologies that are developing all the time. But, uh, and those are expensive. Uh, but I don't think anybody here is in it to make money. I think they're in it because it's what they do, it's what they care about, and they're determined. At City of Hope, our doctors, researchers, and caregivers are working hard to find a cure for cancer, diabetes, AIDS, and other life-threatening diseases. For patients all over the world, they're more than just great people. They're lifesavers. To find out how you can help support this important work, visit cityofhope.org slash giving. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and also with AIDS. Okay, so we'll continue on. So moving on to um, the next endeavor, which was the development of an assay to measure HIV RNA viral load. So at the time that this work was initiated, the standard was a qualitative antibody test that delivered essentially a yes-no result for viral infection and gave no indication of the viral load, which turns out to be highly prognostic for outcomes um, in HIV-infected patients, uh, which led to, of course, um, the development of a quantitative RT-PCR assay to measure HIV um, viral load, which was patented by uh, the Rossi lab, what, 20 plus years ago now? Uh, sorry, I can't read the date. Um, this also led to a commercial test to, um, to quantify viral load in HIV-infected patient serum samples. So this gave physicians the ability to truly understand whether or not the novel therapies that were emerging at, um, during this era were actually moving the needle in terms of um, HIV infection. So again, another notable accomplishment. Um, next step was the emergence of RNAi, which is a, um, a more potent gene siling turned out to be a more potent gene silencing approach relative to the uh, early work done with ribozymes. Uh, so the lab explored early on the potential of RNAi for first gene studies and also an HIV agent. So I remember 15 or so years ago um, talking with my father um, and seeing the excitement around um, this potential modality. Um, when I started working in industry, one of my first jobs was actually screening um, RNA uh, compounds to understand gene function um, at Amgen. Okay, so a quick introduction to RNAi. So this was discovered by Andrew Fire and Craig C. Mello and C. Elegans. Uh, this discovery led to the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Uh, this is a process through which small RNAs are targeted to messenger RNAs, resulting in their destruction. RNAi's advantages over ribozymes led us to adopt the technology for future applications, uh, including better potency, they were easier to make, and they were not subject to inactivation by point mutation. So adopting RNAi in the Rossi lab for anti-HIV therapeutic intervention. We combined our ribozyme therapeutic strategy with RNAi and a nucleic acid-based competitive inhibitor. This approach targeted HIV regulatory proteins, its viral genome, and the human CCR5 chemokine receptor, which allows viral entry. To date, seven patients have been treated at the City of Hope under the protocols listed on the slide. Uh, the clinical study is ongoing for safety and efficacy. The seven subjects treated, um, notably, are alive and well. Uh, so a happy accident, discovery that size matters for RNA interference function. So early siRNA designs <laughs> leveraged uh, 21 to 23 nucleotide dupes. Someone was laughing in the audience, so they got the joke. Um, that were um, I'll let me start over. Uh, early siRNA design leveraged 21 to 23 nucleotide duplexes that were transferred into mammalian cells for functional studies. So we tested constructs both within and immediately above this range. 
We found that lengthening the, nucle the nucleotide duplex to 27 produced superior silencing. This length was later shown to engage DICER, resulting in a more potent gene silencing complex. And the figure on the right shows with the open uh, triangles and a, a leftward shift in the IC50 um, for inhibition of EGFP. A uh, result that was later patented by Dr. Rossi and used to found a company called Dicerna. So a new role for microRNAs. So Dr. Rossi's lab is also interested in studying the role of small endogenous microRNAs and their regulatory function. So they uncovered an inverse relationship between expe expression of MER320 and the RNA polymerase 3 subunit POLR3D. This demonstrated microRNA mediated gene silencing for the first time. Results were published in PNAS by uh, Dr. Kim et al. And, and this resulted in the receiving of the Cozzarelli Prize for Best Biochemistry Finding in 2019. This is an award given out by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So again, congratulations. So another RNA application in my lab, aptamers. So what are aptamers? Uh, these are nucleic acids with a tertiary structure allowing both receptor binding and, inter and internalization. Um, in our lab, we have developed a system to evolve highly specific aptamers against therapeutic targets. Through this process, the Rossi Lab has developed aptamers against the HIV envelope protein, CCR5, and also solid tumor targets, which was a new frontier for the Rossi Lab, moving beyond um, thinking about viral diseases um, and moving into cancer. So aptamer function against HIV. We found that aptamers are very effective at blocking HIV cellular entry in vitro and in vivo. Additionally, they provide excellent carriers for other oligonucleotide therapies. You can think of this as a Trojan horse for delivery of an siRNA or another therapeutic um, molecule. An aptamer against the HIV envelope protein GP120 blocked viral cellular entry, which also allowed internalization of attached siRNAs against T TNPO3, CD4, and also HIV TATREV. So new direction, small activating RNAs, so the next step in the journey. S, uh, short activating RNAs are molecules that are uh, 21 base pairs in length and consist of an RNA duplex. They function by activating transcription of silence genes through direct interaction with enhancer and promoter regions in a risk complex dependent manner. Dramatic changes in gene expression and mRNA levels of target genes have been demonstrated as published by Rebai et al. in Oncogene in 2018. Short activating RNAs can also be conjugated to a range of nanoparticles for therapeutic delivery. So in thinking about a strategy for cancer, uh, the CEBPA um, protein is a master regulator of hepatic function and whose expression is known to suppress liver disease. In a collaboration with Imperial College of London, the Rossi Lab helped to design short activating RNAs targeting the CEBPA promoter. In vivo data from rats demonstrated a doubling of CEBPM RNA, which is shown in the figure on the right, following um, treatment. Dr. Nagi Habib uh, will explain this strategy in greater detail today at 3.45 p.m. So there's the plug that you asked for. <laughs> Um, okay, so moving to the end of the talk. So this is a photo of the uh, current Rossi Lab members uh, taken uh, Christmas of, of this past year. So you can still see that Dr. Rossi runs a fairly large um, uh, research program at the City of Hope with numerous uh, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and also um, full-time employees. Uh, going back to 2011, you can see, um, you know, the lab hasn't shrunk much um, it, over the last eight or nine years. You can see Dr. Rossi there standing on the left-hand side um, with, with his group at the time. And then also uh, we wanted to point out the ribozyme gene therapy group at the City of Hope in 1994. Um, some of the notable members, of course, Dr. John Zaya, who we mentioned earlier. You can see Dr. Steve Foreman standing in the back, and, and Dr. Don Cohn from UCLA uh, was also a member of this group. And, and Dr. Rossi is sitting there on the right-hand side in the blue shirt. Um, of course, it takes... Um, a nation or villagers, as, as the slide says. So these are some of the key um, individuals who have contributed over the past 40 years to Dr. Rossi's success um, at the City of Hope. And then I'll close prior to the question and answer session with a quote from Louis Pasteur. To those who devote their lives to science, nothing can give more happiness than making discoveries, but their cups of joy are full only when the results of their studies find practical applications. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Rossi for question and answers and I'll help as needed. Thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you very much for that great presentation. And we're now open for questions. So if I can start, uh, Dr. Rossi, just by asking you to speculate on the future impact of RNA-based therapeutics in general terms, where you think it's going? I think it might replace gene therapy in general as a way to treat cancer and other diseases such as diabetes. Very promising future. And which type of RNA therapeutic do you think is going to have the most impact? I like this more active in the RNA approach, turning genes on. We all know how to turn genes off as well with small RNAs, the yin and the yang. Regulation of transcription. Okay. So I, I actually have a, a question. What, uh, at this stage of your career, what, what continues to motivate you? If there was one thing that you could point out that gets you out of bed in the morning and um, gets you excited to go into work every day? My laboratory. Training, training young people. So continued education. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have a question back here. Yes. Hi, Dr. Rossi. It is wonderful to see you here. Thank you so much for everything you've done. We're currently expanding a lot of the types of mRNA, or RNAs that we're using. Um, my personal specialty is mRNA and long non-coding. You're looking at smaller RNAs where secondary structure is part of the performance. For the longer RNAs, would you expect the same thing? I think both classes of RNAs have a bright future. Longer, longer for messenger RNAs, therapies, shorter RNAs for turning turn genes on and off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what about synthetic RNAs? What's going on with synthetic RNAs and other ways of making RNAs with different um, chemical composition to modulate their stability and make them more druggable? There's a huge amount of progress in that area. RNAs are very stable now. Chem chem chemically, RNAs are very stable and they're cost effective to make now, which is a huge fact for, for therapeutics. Okay. John, sir, congratulations. Thank you. Inspiration to the field. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, in one of the pictures, you, you have seen this the current group, which is very large. So, with your vision, what are the areas you are looking at right now? Three, three the, major the areas. The question is with, with your vision. Dr. Rossi, what are you looking at now? A big area for me right now is think about HIV-mediated. Neurologic effects in the brain. We're trying to target the brain with our therapies. Yep. So first of all, John, again, congratulations on this award and for such a lifetime of achievement. A lot of the small RNAs that have activity are on the order of 20 to 25 nucleotides long. Of course, that's just a little bit above a unique sequence in a mammalian genome. But is there any significance that it's also roughly, for those activating RNAs, roughly two turns of a double helix. And might that have something to do with st stabilization or whatever? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? 
Repeat the question, please. Oh, the, the first is the observation that so many small RNAs that have activity in the cell are on the order of around 20 to 25 nucleotides, which is about a unique sequence, a little above that, for a mammalian genome. But I'm wondering if in addition to that, any of the RNAs that are interacting with the DNA double helix, whether or not there's stabilization issues, because that's about two turns of a double helix. Okay. My thought is that they actually interact with long non coding RNAs at the, at the promoter regions, not with, not with DNA itself. So it has to be some unique size limitation. That's, that's what generates these products in the cell. Okay, so this may be the last question, but I can't resist asking you. It, um, th there's this discussion that has been going on for a long time about whether the um, whether life on Earth originated as RNA, of course it evolved it from <laughs> RNA, so your opinion? It's an, it is an RNA world. 